We thought it would be interesting tonight in this smaller venue uh, to look at one media outlet and how war influences it, how it goes to war. How does it decide on what to cover? How does it decide what kind of resources to allocate? What are the impediments, the constraints uh, on what gets covered? People suddenly, I was just talking to one of our former students, Theola Labe, who's works for the Washington Post now, and she said she went from covering school board meetings in Maryland to Iraq. So a lot of people have to prepare very quickly uh, to get out and, and cover some of these conflicts. So we've deputized uh, Roan Tempest, uh, who has been a LA Times correspondent for many, many years, who actually uh, went to Berkeley uh, and now teaches at the journalism school. Uh, and has been posted around the world uh, in Paris, Delhi, Beijing, Hong Kong, and then uh, in Afghanistan and has covered a number of other conflicts. We've deputized him to try to wrangle his colleagues through some sort of a, a discussion on how their paper confronted the, this war. And how now, a year out on this anniversary that's just about to come up, uh, they feel they did. What were, the, what were the, the missed opportunities? What were the pressures? And where did they think they excelled? And how did the rest of the media landscape look from, from their perspective? So without further ado, Ron, let me uh, turn it over. To, Ron is here. Let me turn over the uh, uh, rest of the evening to uh, Ron Tempest. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Herbal. That's probably the first time you guys have heard the theme of the conference, right? <laughs> um, I'm really happy with this panel. Uh, not only are they my colleagues, but it's, they're really the A-team of the Los Angeles Times. And if you want, the, if you want to know, if you had to choose a, a group of people to go to war with or to go to panel with, this would be the one you would choose. Um, so I think what we'll do is divide this into two parts. I'm going to go through the panel twice and everybody's going to keep their comments relatively short so that we have some time for questions afterwards. Um, but the first is going to be devoted to, you know, this idea is how a big paper, and, and I think talking to other people, it's important to distinguish that there's an economy of scale here. When you're talking about a paper that has 25 full-time correspondents or thereabouts, and then the resources to draw upon twice that number of other correspondents and uh, nearly 100 photographers and so on, you have a lot more options. The, logist the logistics are more complicated, but it's kind of a deeper bench than other places. So what we're really discussing here is how a major paper uh, goes to, prepares to go to war. And um, that said, let me introduce first uh, uh, Marjorie Miller, the foreign editor, who should give you an overview. And the second part we go through, we'll go through the lessons learned, as Orville mentioned. So um, let me start with Marjorie, I'll give you an overview, I think, of, uh, of uh, what's involved in a major newspaper going to war, covering a war. Thanks. Um, uh, as Roan said, I, I started this job in July 2002. And I came back to the country and stopped in Washington on my way uh, west and asked everyone I met whether they could come up with a coherent argument for why we wouldn't go to war. And no one could present me with one. So I just uh, started then assuming that we were going to war and came to LA. And the first task was to convince everyone at the paper that we were going to war because no one could really believe it then. Why would we go to war? We, we, it's not really possible, is it? And so, um, but I did manage to convince uh, the, uh, the, the, editor, the editors above me and the reporters and the uh, technical people that we had to get ready for war. 
um, and basically spent the first uh, eight months g uh, getting ready to go to war. A newspaper of our size is a lot like the military. We have to um, decide how many people to deploy, what equipment we need, how many troops, what, t what our tactics are going to be, get the supplies. Um, in this case, we decided uh, post uh, killing of Daniel Pearl, most American papers decided that they want to actually start training journalists before they go to war, which was a novel concept. Um, and so everyone went to uh, Centurion training, a, a course in everything from first aid to um, what to do in a grenade attack um, and a kidnapping. Uh, we got chemical suits for everyone because uh, you might remember that we were all warned that there could be a chemical war. So uh, all of that uh, took many months. Um, the problem with the media is the same problem that the military faces, which is that to some degree you're always preparing for the last war. And uh, in this case, it was particularly difficult because you had a Bush president, you had a country we had already gone to war against, although this one was going to be fought in Iraq, not in Kuwait. Um, you had the same enemy, Saddam Hussein, um, and many of the same uh, political and military advisors in this country, Powell, Cheney, and so on. Um, so you thought it might look like the last war, but you knew that the difference this time was that we were actually going to try to take out Saddam Hussein, which was not the goal last time. And so it could potentially be a fight to the death. So we had to uh, plan for that. Um, in uh, the first uh, Gulf War against Saddam Hussein, um, we were pretty much locked out. The uh, media was not able to stay in Baghdad. Uh, many newspaper editors pulled their reporters out and then Saddam Hussein kicked the rest out. And the military in, the, in that Gulf War um, did not give us access. In fact, it was uh, their express goal to keep us away from the front and to corral reporters uh, anywhere but where the action was. So our first goal was to figure out how to cover this war. Um, I wanted to be in Baghdad. We were having trouble getting reporters into Baghdad at the time because the uh, government wasn't happy with what we had been writing. So I went to Baghdad to convince the government that um, they should let us in and stayed until I was able to get a visa. And in fact, what I did was I took um, bios and clips and um, everything I could of uh, four reporters, and I said to them that I would like all four reporters in, but in fact I would have been happy to get any one of them in, and finally they agreed to let one in, and that was John Danishevsky, who at the time was our Moscow bureau chief. So I waited until he got in uh, before leaving, and um, we also brought in our uh, fixer translator researcher from Moscow. Um, on a credential of a Russian newspaper. And you have to remember back that we had no idea what was going to happen. Would these people become hostages? Would they be killed? Would they have to find a way out? Uh, so one reason I wanted our Russian um, researcher there was the idea that possibly he could get John into the Russian embassy if things got very ugly. Um, but John got in and he stayed and he was able to stay for the whole uh, the whole war. Uh, so, so that was that side. Then we wanted to be with the U.S. military. Now, this time the military said we're going to embed reporters. We'd never heard that word before. We weren't sure what it meant. Uh, we didn't want to be in bed with the military, but we certainly wanted to be there. And we didn't know if it was a trick or if it was um, actually they, for some reason that we couldn't fathom, had decided to give us access. Um, so it was very difficult. They were determining the number of embeds, as it became called, that each paper would get. And they gave us nine. And um, we, as the reporters, took six and gave three to the photographers. And it was very hard to know whether this was too little, too much, whether we should put our most experienced reporters, like David, uh, on the military because uh, he had experience with the military or whether we could uh, risk losing our most experienced reporters, that they would end up corralled in Kuwait and never get anywhere near the front. 
Uh, so we ended up doing a mix. Uh, we picked some experienced reporters and we picked some of the greener reporters and hoped for the best. Um, and in fact, um, of the six, three ended up being very good close to the front uh, embeds in part through the resourcefulness of the reporters. And one, one ended up uh, spending the entire war in Colorado uh, because the 4th Infantry uh, never got out of Colorado. Um, and in another example of how you're preparing for the last war, we decided that we wanted an, uh, uh, to be on the ships because uh, with the pilots because in Gulf War, the first Gulf War, what I call the first Gulf War, um, there was a long air war and we thought there might be a long air war this time and so you want to be on the ships when the pilots come back or going out with the pilots if you can. And it turned out there really wasn't an air war. So that one uh, was lost to us as well, basically. Um, beyond that, uh, we wanted to make sure we were in every country surrounding Iraq and every country that could uh, potentially be important. We had to cover Israel because we thought it was very possible that they would launch missiles uh, against Israel and Kuwait, which was lending itself to U.S. forces. Uh, Saudi Arabia could potentially be uh, unstable. We wanted to be in Jordan, Syria, anywhere we thought refugees might end up. So in all, um, we had about 25 uh, reporters in the field. And um, in addition to that, the other problem that we had during the first Gulf War was that um, because we didn't have access to Baghdad or the military, so significant access, a lot of the stories ended up being written out of Washington and had undue influence of the Pentagon, we felt. So we wanted to make sure that didn't happen again. Again, we didn't know going in how much access we were going to have in the field. So we decided to do two things this time to try to prevent against that. One is, um, Tracy and uh, another experienced correspondent, Tyler Marshall, um, went to Doha where there was also a U.S. military base set up and served as um, both rewrite people for the embeds and um, as kind of first line editors in real time because of course there's an 11 or 12 hour time difference between the Middle East and Los Angeles. And uh, what David will talk more about this, but the embeds were extremely valuable as mosaic pieces. But they were, um, and we did get access, but they could only see as far as they could see. And it was up to Tracy and Tyler to begin the process of putting some of those uh, little pieces of the puzzle into perspective, and they would do that there. And secondly, with 25 reporters out in the field, they risk tripping over each other and, you know, four of them going off to write the same story every day. So they would uh, coordinate those reporters. So we had, in, in essence, a filter out in the field uh, early in the 24-hour the day. Uh, then in Los Angeles, we had uh, editors coming in early and we had set up a war desk where we took many of the best editors of the paper and rewrite people. And so the main story, the main news story of the day, which is the one that um, uh, in the first Gulf War really ended up quite um, overly influenced by Washington and the Pentagon, was actually put together in LA. I mean, the first cut was often put together in Doha. Then it was reassembled as the day went on in LA. And so what that meant was that what you were getting from the military, from Iraq, from uh, allied countries, from other unallied countries, was going into a, uh, a main bar in LA. And we were trying to balance the relative weight of all that information in LA. Um, and I think um, it was a lot more successful than it was uh, the first time around. I, I think I'll end, but I just want to say that, you know, as, as correspondents, we always view ourselves as taking a first cut at history, but it's not history. It's just the first cut, and I think what we're trying to do is to get as clear a picture in the moment as we can, and I think this system was relatively successful. So I'll stop there. So now we're going to move to the Washington Bureau. 
where Bob Drogan is a national security correspondent. And when the when the rumors of war started, <clears throat> um, he mobilized as well. And he's not one of these people in the Washington Bureau who takes over a story. He, he supplements it and enhances it. Longtime foreign correspondent, uh, you. If you follow the LA Times, you know that he did very strong early reporting on the uh, very like, likely possibility that there weren't any weapons of mass destruction um, and a lot of other reporting along those lines. So maybe, Bob, you can talk about what it's like to be in Washington, what your role is, and uh, uh, where you go with that. Yeah, thank you. Um, in August of 2002, Vice President Cheney gave a speech in which he uh, sort of uh, declared war in Iraq, uh, although it wasn't widely recognized at the time. He said it was time to take the battle to the enemy and that simply stated there's no doubt that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and no doubt he's amassing to use them against friends and that uh, many of us are convinced Saddam Hussein had, will have nuclear weapons fairly soon. Um, uh, he also predicted that uh, the streets of Basra and Bagra are sure to erupt in joy when the way throngs in Kabul greeted the Americans. Um, I, you know, having, I, I cover intelligence in Washington and, uh, you know, this came as a big surprise to me. Uh, it seemed like, uh, you know, I went back and looked at the uh, CIA annual declarations, uh, annual reports to Congress on uh, threats and uh, didn't really see any huge change in their assessments of the threat from Iraq. And so uh, uh, various statements from the administration had been uh, that Saddam was essentially in his box, that sanctions were working various other elements were working. So uh, the obvious question was what had changed and if so, uh, was Cheney right about Saddam's weapons? And uh, uh, the upshot was I had a conversation with the managing editor at the Los Angeles Times within several days of Cheney's speech. And uh, we agreed it would make sense for me to try and answer those questions. Uh, what did we really know about uh, Iraq's uh, biological, chemical and nuclear weapons? What did Saddam really have? Uh, what did the intelligence show? Where did he keep all of this stuff? Where did he buy it? Uh, how did he get it across the border? And, uh, you know, these seemed fairly basic questions. Um, I think trying to find those answers has uh, guided much of what we in the Washington Bureau have done uh, in the last 18 months. Uh, I think not since Vietnam, perhaps, uh, have we uh, made such an effort to sort of truth squad, if you will, to that is to fact check the accuracy of uh, what our uh, elected leaders are saying about the nature of a, of a threat to this country, uh, as well as its plans for uh, dealing with that kind of threat. Uh, arguably not since Vietnam has there been that uh, distinct a gap between what their public pronouncements were, both at the UN and in the State of the Union speeches, in various pronouncements uh, at the, to Congress and CIA white papers and whatnot. And the truth, as far as we in the press have been able to uh, establish it, um, I think it's been uh, fairly eye-opening to all of us. Um, and, and I'm proud to say that, you know, from that first uh, step, that is in August of 2002, I wrote my first story, you know, uh, within two weeks of that. Uh, the LA Times put almost all of our stories questioning the intelligence on the front page and, and often led the paper with it. Um, Marjorie described uh, the foreign uh, resources that were assigned to this a uh, huge story. Uh, in Washington, we have what we call our security pod. The Washington Bureau is, I, I think it's about 40 people at this point, and it, our security pod it consists of two reporters full-time uh, covering the intelligence community, uh, generally three at the State Department, two full-time at the Pentagon, uh, someone at the UN who works for Marjorie, uh, one on terrorism full-time, and various investigative and projects reporters who kind of move in and out on issues like contracts and the rest. Um, we had a lot of communications with our colleagues overseas. Uh, some of the pre-war stories that we all worked on were obvious, you know, what was happening at the UN, what was happening in terms of governments uh, assessing things, but we also had a great deal of flexibility. I spent a fair bit of time uh, both before and after the war trying to track down, look at Saddam Hussein's um, network of, of uh, procurement operations around the world, basically the smuggling activities they did to get weapons and dual-use materials went to Europe a couple of times, went to Iraq, went to India, went to a number of places, and, uh, uh, and, and when I went to Iraq to, to track down the actual scientists. Um, covering a war from Washington is obviously a contradiction in terms, uh, it, you know, but it is where decisions are made, and uh, so it is a crucial front uh, in the story. It's a crucial part of the story. 
Um, I think it's far too easy, as, as Marjorie was, was suggesting, to sit in Washington and to assume that a government official uh, knows more about what's happening overseas than the people who are there on the ground, uh, you know, or a talking head sitting on a, t a Sunday talk show. It's much easier. I I'm ashamed to say that uh, every Sunday, people at my bureau, myself included when I'm assigned to it, and people at every other news organization in Washington actually are assigned to sit there and watch the Sunday talk shows to see what propaganda, you know, our, our leaders are, are putting out to us um, about these things. Uh, I cover the intelligence agencies, so I'm sort of lucky my people usually don't talk in public. Um, <laughs> it's, it's much easier to, to cover and much easier to say, I'm sorry, I can't match that story. Um, what's remarkable, I think, in retrospect, is obviously uh, not only how wrong uh, Vice President Cheney was uh, back in August of 2002, um, I, I think it's fair to say uh, virtually everybody was wrong. Um, when he said there's no doubt Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, uh, the fact is at that time there really was very little doubt in the inter U.S. intelligence community, in the United Nations, in the German intelligence, in French intelligence, in British intelligence. I've talked to these people. They will, you know, Hans Blix will be here tomorrow. You can ask him. You know, before the war he thought there were chemical weapons in Iraq, and he was fairly sure there were biological weapons in Iraq. Uh, everybody was fairly sure there were no nuclear programs, but Dick Cheney notwithstanding. That, that one was pretty much a slam dunk. Um, I think everyone was uh, sure Saddam Hussein had mustard and nerve gases. He almost certainly had germ weapons. I think it comes, I've had any number of conversations with David Kay over the last several weeks. And uh, you know, the, the apotheosis of David Kay, the, the religious conversion uh, that he has gone through since uh, he went to Iraq and when he came back and sat at the CIA and was put in a room for a month with not, without a working telephone and without a working computer uh, because they sort of didn't know what to do with him has been sort of a fascinating experience to watch. <laughs> Um, should we be surprised at how bad the intelligence is? I'm one of these people who sort of isn't concerned about the so-called misuse of intelligence in this war. I think the reality is that the intelligence itself was so bad, you know, leaders get elected, they do what they do, and you know, we don't like it, we throw them out, we elect somebody else. But the intelligence that we pay $40 billion a year for was so unbelievably bad in this case, it's sort of hard to find a place where they actually got it right. Um, I had a, <coughs> George Tennant, uh, the, the director of Central Intelligence, spoke at Georgetown recently, and he had a great line. He said, um, he, sa he sort of justified the fiasco by saying, uh, quote, we never get it all right and we never get it all wrong. And I, I thought, how would that look, you know, on a masthead of our newspaper, you know? <laughs> that, that's, that's our standard now. Um, you know, now I, I've been covering intelligence for about five years, and I can tell you there's an awful lot of Maxwell smarts out there, as, as well as the James, James Bond types. Um, the reality is, you know, you'll hear a lot of talk about uh, how bad the human intelligence was in Iraq. Uh, the reality is the CIA has ne it's a hard thing to do, and the CIA never had a high-level uh, intelligence, had never had a high-level spy uh, in, North, or in Korea or in China during the Korea War, never had a high-level one in Hanoi during the Vietnamese War, never had one in, uh, in, Bar in Baghdad during Gulf War I, in Gulf War II, never had one in the Kremlin during the Cold War. I mean, this is a hard thing to do. So what they fall back on is, well, we've got all these high-tech stuff, we've got all these cool satellites and things, and they can take lots of pictures. I've got to tell you a great story, which, which I haven't yet written in my newspaper, but, but I will soon, because I just got this the other day, that when the... Um, uh, you know, they were wrong on so much. They were wrong on the chemical weapons, wrong on biological, wrong on nuclear, wrong on the UAVs, the unmanned, uh, you know, the drone vehicles. They're wrong on the mobile labs, wrong on the 45 minutes, you know, we can, they can launch in 45 minutes, wrong on aluminum tubes and all the rest of it. But they say, yeah, but we got all these cool, cool, you know, satellite images. I talked to a guy who uh, was uh, spent, did 60 inspections with the UN uh, before the war, and he said that Iraq used to hide their scuds, their missiles, in these long cylindrical, cylinder-like buildings. And so the, the satellite images would come back and say, oh, we found this cool satellite image, and it would show the thing. Well, it turns out Iraqi farmers keep their chickens, chicken coops, in long cylinder-like buildings. <laughs> and he said they went to about 60 chicken farms over these 60 inspections, and they ultimately had T-shirts printed that said, Ballistic Chicken Inspection Teams <laughs> for the UN. So. I'll leave it at that. And, uh, David, um, you're going to speak. Well, did I mention your book, your forthcoming book? Yeah. I've already mentioned that. It's coming out next month. <clears throat> um, it's called Th Thunder Run. <laughs> um, David was embedded, and I hope, I hope all of you have read 
his story. If not, look it up. It's one of the best pieces of journalism uh, in the last couple of years for sure. Uh, and it's not official because they don't announce these things publicly, but uh, he's a finalist in the Pulitzer this year. So maybe you can talk a little bit about being embedded. And then I'm going to switch the order a little bit, Tracy, and put you next so that Rick can show his uh, stuff. Okay, okay? So you'll be after David. Go ahead, David. Uh, Marjorie talked about fighting the last war, which uh, is a pretty good analogy because that, the, the first mistake I made when I heard about this embedding process and, and, and tried to get into it was basically to fight the last war. I had been embedded uh, along with Rick in Afghanistan with uh, the 82nd Airborne a couple of times and with Special Forces, so I thought it would be a great idea to email all these guys, go back to them and say, hey, I've got a chance to get an embed spot. What would you recommend? Every last one of those guys said, oh, man, you've got to go with Airborne. Airborne is the way to go, and, and Airborne had a big role, the 101st particularly in, in the first Gulf War. Uh, they said, you do not want to be with the 3rd Infantry Division because you're going to be stuck in a, in a tank or a Bradley. You'll be out on, on the edge of Baghdad. You're going to be encircling Baghdad. You won't see anything. It'll be confusing. You won't have anything because the Airborne is going to go into the city because the tanks are going to be out protecting them on these forward operating bases and the airborne will go in and you can go in on an air assault and you'll have a great story. I said, man, that's great. So I decided to go with air assault. And in fact, that was the plan. I found out later that was exactly the plan, but it got turned on its head uh, on April 7th when the third ID uh, decided to go into the city and stay. And it was the airborne that was on the outside. So I started with the uh, 101st airborne in Kuwait. Um, didn't realize they had given me uh, what they call a lift unit. These are the, it's basically the bus company. It's uh, Chinooks and Blackhawks that ferry troops and equipment back and forth, but they were never going to stay in Iraq. They would go just across the border once the war started, drop things off and come right back. So I was stuck there for a while and uh, realized the good thing about embedding was you get incredible access. You find out Every briefing you go get all the intelligence, but I was getting intelligence on which Blackhawk was going to take which soldier where, and that's good for maybe half a story. Uh, so I was getting pretty desperate and decided to look around the camp and try to find a way to get to the war, and you weren't supposed to jump units, but there was no public affairs guys at all. There was nobody there. Nobody cared what I did. Nobody was paying attention to me, and I think... Probably a lot of reporters had that same experience because war is so busy and so crazy and these guys have so much on their minds, they are not worried about the reporter. And believe me, they're not trying to co-op you, they're not trying to work, work you. They just kind of want you to be out of the way, they're not worried about what you're writing. Um, that was great, but again, I needed to be near the, the front, so I found another unit of the 101st that I was told um, was going into Iraq and talked to the commander and you know, got him to embed me unofficially. Um, and that's when the great sandstorm hit that everybody remembers, I think. So they got up in the air, stayed up there, couldn't see anything, came back. So I was still stuck there. And then I, I mean, there's this long progression. I guess the point being is when you're kind of stuck in this embed process, you're really stuck with the unit that they give you. Uh, my advice would be don't take the unit they give you. Actually, before the war, I had tried with the Pentagon to, once I found out I was in this unit to move me, and they just laughed at me and said, no, you're stuck there for life, you know, tough break. But um, I found another unit that actually was going in um, that ended up after two, days after, two or three days after the war started um, in southern Iraq. Um, these guys were all excited. They're the Rakasans. I don't know if you heard of this. This is a famous infantry unit, and they're, they're pretty tough guys, and they were all fired up, and they were ready to kill people. They really wanted to get in there, and they got stuck guarding the gas station. They have this thing called, I was at a place called FARP Shell. It's forward, forward arming and refueling point, and it's basically a whole bunch of gas in huge containers, and I mean fuel for the, uh, for the tanks, for the helicopters. These guys were guarding it, so we sat in the desert for a week while the 3rd Infantry Division, the people I was told not to go with, are rushing towards Baghdad. Um, these guys were very, very frustrated, and I was too, and um, people talk about some of the, the parallels between combat and, and reporting, and that's one of them, because when you're sitting on your ass every day and, and nothing's happening, you really get frustrated when you know the war is out there, and these guys were frustrated, and I was frustrated. Um, we went to briefings every day for about a week sitting there in the desert, 
Um, they got a new order every day. They were going, and they got all fired up, and they went through the whole briefing and went through the rehearsal and then found out that night they weren't going. Um, finally, we found out we were going, but because of um, the threat from anti-aircraft, they weren't going in their helicopters, which is the way they always go on air assault. They had to go on trucks, which was a disaster. Um, and I think Roan mentioned I was thrown in the water, and this was uh, uh, on this trip through the desert in the middle of the night. Um, it was a 75-vehicle convoy, and they decide to go with their lights out so the enemy doesn't know they're coming, right? <laughs> like, they don't know these 75 vehicles are barreling through the desert. So not only do they have their lights out, they have these poor kids driving with their uh, night optical devices. And I don't know if you've ever looked through those. There's no depth perception. You can't see anything. It's all green and milky. And my driver went right into a canal. Um, and uh, that's when I lost all my, all my equipment, which is not a good idea in the, in the war zone. Um, <laughs> But there is camaraderie. There was a, 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 a new best friend named uh, Greg Zoroya, a guy for uh, USA Today, who saved me and let me use his uh, sat phone uh, and, his, and his laptop, uh, which was tough because I had to go second. I mean, once he got his story in. Um, <laughs> but uh, we ended up with this unit finally getting, th their goal was to get to the Baghdad airport. And they were all excited because they thought they were taking the airport. And this will show you how cut off you are and how nobody knows anything. We all thought we were taking the airport. Little did we know that the day before, the 3rd ID had taken the airport. But the commanders know this, but I wasn't up in the command element. The commanders know all this. The guys I was with, the lowliest guys in the trucks, had no clue. So we're all fired up. We get to the airport. We, uh, we get lost, we get shelled, we get mortared, horrible things are happening. Um, we're on the road for 30 hours, everybody's tired and cranky. Uh, the NCOs, we get there at 3 in the morning, they say, go to sleep for three hours, wake up, we're taking the airport. We sleep for three hours, we wake up in the morning, the guys jump up, ready to go, they look outside, they hear American voices, they go running out, I said, who are you guys? We're the third ID. Oh good, you can help us take the airport. Well, third ID said, well, we took the airport yesterday, so these guys get totally deflated. So, um, basically, I can stop now, because I mean, <laughs> this could go forever. Um, I don't, no, I'll wrap up now. Well, I don't want to sit here and tell war stories, because I know you have questions, and um, yeah. I'm not sure what to get into, because you guys have all read about embedding, probably. Yeah, more if than you, you haven't, there's a book coming out next month. <laughs> That's right. And it's not about embedding. So uh, I will pass to uh, my colleague, Tracy. Uh, yeah, Tracy, if, uh, but Tracy's most recently in Iraq, and, uh, um, you know, a colleague of mine from Le Monde, or who's also in this conference, Patrice Claude, said from his perspective, the war began when the invasion stopped, and so the, the occupation has really been the dominant story for a long time. Tracy was most recently there and can talk about uh, some of the challenges of covering the occupation. Okay, yeah, I didn't uh, go into Iraq, in fact, until after Baghdad fell. Um, so, yeah, the war was over. Supposedly, the invasion was completed and um, the occupation was starting. Um, the dangers of covering the occupation and then the resistance to it um, were particularly intense, in part because of the random nature and the unpredictability of, of some of the violence. The lines of battle are not as clear as, in theory, they, they are during a, a regular war. Um, soldiers shoot cars at checkpoints. Checkpoints appear where they weren't before. Uh, the other side then eventually was, started blowing up uh, bombs in places like restaurants and uh, busy streets. Um, as a journalist, you can be targeted or you can be unlucky. Um, I, I had covered occupation before, having been in Jerusalem for, for several years, so I had some expectation, I think, but it wasn't, uh, was not nearly enough. Uh, Iraq turned out to be a lot more violent and ultimately a lot more dangerous than, um, certainly than, than covering the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Journalists in Iraq every day have to make decisions about whether it's safe enough to go down a road, to enter a village. Um, from the moment you decide to go into Iraq, you have to decide, well, should I fly in and risk getting shot down? Should I drive in and risk getting um, carjacked? And that kind of calculation we make uh, every day. Um, in the first weeks and couple months of the occupation, um, I think we were, it was a very 
effervescent time. A lot of emotions were raw and people, every Iraqi you met had a story to tell and it was pretty exciting. And we had reporters in the south, in Baghdad, the central area, and in the, the north. Um, we, were, we were, I think, pretty well covered. Um, and we began covering what would become the resistance, um, figuring out who they were, what they were up to, what they, what they wanted. Um, and as I'm sure, of course, the, the danger grew over time, and you're, I'm sure, aware there are debates going on now at newspapers about what is the safest way to continue covering this occupation. Um, should reporters live in a hotel? Should we live in a house? Um, how to maintain, how do we maintain a low profile? Um, what, are, what are the best ways? Should you have armed guards? Uh, some journalists apparently are even thinking about arming themselves. Our bureau, um, I'll tell you a little bit about it, we, um, we got a bureau in a house very early on and um, we thought it was in a pretty safe area and it was a good idea. We had a central location where we could all work from and then over time it, uh, we had new neighbors. First the Turkish consulate moved in next door and then a CIA front operation moved in across the street and then an Iraqi police station up the street. So we figured um, there were multiple targets and we have since moved. We've moved now to another house in what we hope and think is a safer neighborhood and that's, uh, that's where we are based. Uh, some journalists have made the decision it's better to be at a hotel. Some are even thinking about dispersing more and not being in a central location, but for now this is what we're doing. Um, at any one time we have four reporters uh, based in Iraq. Um, there's, there are two bureau chiefs and a, a third sort of permanent reporter and then someone else rotating in all the time, but in fact because it's such a stressful job everyone's ro rotating in and out, three or six week uh, stints. We have a large staff of Iraqi translators and drivers. Um, we have a, an, an Iraqi office manager and an Iraqi techie who sort of keeps our very complex system of satellites and computers working miraculously. We, um, the drivers use their own cars and we've sort of made that decision thinking that this is a way for us to maintain a low profile. We're not in, you know, the big suburban GMCs or, and we're not even in armored cars uh, generally. We have one there but um, uh, we've just got too many reporters and too much going on to, uh, to be able to use it um, for everybody. So, so we use um, the local cars with our drivers. Um, our drivers are very good. They have an extra antenna out at all time and, and I think have saved our asses many a time. They, uh, they can see when something is starting to bubble and you're doing interviews in Fallujah as I have been and there's a crowd gathering and it's time to go and you know that, that happens quite a bit. Um, they also work at great risk. You know, working with Americans um, has become a dangerous occupation for uh, Iraqis as well, many having been killed. Um, the dangers um, pose a, a challenge, I think, for Marjorie, which is to find people who will go, reporters who will go. Um, we, she literally has had to beg several times to get reporters uh, who are willing to go cover what is the biggest story around, and yet there, there are not enough reporters who, who want to take those risks. Well, there's a kind of an infamous memo that went around the LA Times around Christmas time, something like, who wants to spend Christmas in Baghdad, I think was it. <laughs> yeah, and there were a few takers, believe it or not, but uh, um, violence is not the only challenge in covering the occupation. Um, the occupation authority has set itself up in a way that is wholly unfriendly to, to journalists. They're fortressed away and in Saddam's palaces behind much uh, barbed wire and telephones don't work very well either. So getting information from officials that is not part of their kind of orchestrated press conference um, is made deliberately difficult for us. It can take hours or days even sometimes to gain the ac access to the official you need. Iraqis um, have a hard time distinguishing between us American reporters and, and the American occupation, um, we're seen often, not, not all the time, but often as an extension of the occupation. And consequently that then creates um, a lot more hostility towards us than uh, certainly than I've experienced in, in other um, Arab countries and other, other situations. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's often forced us to cut reporting short, which means you have to go back to the village the next day, and again, it, it uh, takes longer and longer. Um, crowds after bombings are particularly hostile, understandably, but even in more benign circumstances, often the, the crowds are pretty, it can be hostile. Um, to cover the occupation, we try to follow roughly three themes, military, political, society. Military is obviously what the U.S. Uh, forces are doing and what the resistance is doing, who they are, as I said, and, and how they're evolving. The political side is, of course, the civilian occup occupiers, the, the CPA, the Paul Bremer and all of that, how they're running the country, how they're creating a new government, how they're doing this experiment of nation building, if that's, if that's what it is. And then society, the change or lack thereof um, for Iraqis in Iraq and their institutions, reconciliation, grappling with issues of justice, um, that sort of thing. Um, because every story takes a hundred times longer than you think, um, I say that we try to cover those themes but despite um, our staff's devotion and the correspondent's very long hours and, and great energy, I'm not sure we're giving a complete picture of the occupation, and I think that's the, that's the greatest challenge, ultimately. Thank you very much. That's the best report on covering the occupation I've heard ever. Uh, Rick, if you could uh, maybe talk about uh, what you did, and then maybe he's gonna, you're going to show us some pictures, too. Okay, um, I sort of uh, started off the war as one of the people who was chosen to be embedded. Um, we tried, like the reporters, to sort of blanket different areas where we thought we needed to be. We had somebody in Israel. We had a photographer in the north, in Turkey, trying to come in from the north. And two people were embedded. I was embedded with the Marines. Another photographer was embedded, embedded with the Army. And we had one person come in unilaterally, uh, which means they just had their own vehicle, and they made a charge uh, through the border from Kuwait once the war broke out. And for me, I guess I got chosen to be embedded because I had been in Afghanistan, and David and I had done several embeds with Special Forces and 82nd Airborne, so when they were kind of going through picking who was going to do what, um, I had had that sort of experience and had some of the jargon, some of the funky military jargon down, so uh, they picked me to do that. Um, and it was, you know, there was times during, during, the, during the war that it was the most frustrating place to be because you were in the middle of the war with access to everything that was around you, but no mobility to, to get to anything else. And, you know, if there were days when the whole uh, battalion that I was with was just sitting in the sand digging holes, then that's, you know, that's what I had to photograph. And I would know that something else was going on somewhere else um, in, near the front, closer to the front. And, just be completely frustrated, you know, you're putting your life in danger um, and not being able to actually perform your job was, was at times very frustrating. So the benefit was for being a large newspaper is when nothing was happening with me photographically, somewhere else, you know, we had Carolyn Cole in Baghdad and something would be happening in Baghdad or something would be happening in, in Basra. So it's sort of leapfrog, you know, at, at times I was, you know, at the front of the war and then all of a sudden, you know, it, it it just sort of went, went out from under me. And we would, um, you know, it'd spend a couple of days just sending pictures of troops dry shaving in the desert while, you know, that's, that's all I had in front of me. Um, one of the frustrating things was there was, they wouldn't allow a reporter and a photographer to embed together from the same newspaper, um, which for newspapers made no sense. And it was argued up and down and up and down again and uh, never made any progress. Some papers, were able to get photographers and reporters together because they worked for the same chain of newspapers. So they would get a photographer from one newspaper and a reporter from another, and they worked for the same chain, and that way they were sort of able to do uh, a more cohesive story. What, what we ended up doing, I had a reporter, um, Tony Perry was embedded with the Marines, but we never saw each other until we got to Baghdad. And so communication was very difficult. What, why, what I ended up doing every day was I would call up, um, into, into Doha every day and sort of at least give a briefing of what happened with the unit that I was with so that it could be fed into any story if it was anything um, worth reporting. And uh, once we, um, you know, once the war sort of, Baghdad fell, all of our photographers basically sort of converged on, onto Baghdad and uh, we eventually 
sent everybody, you know, sent, sent people who basically went through the war back home while others who came in fresh from Jordan stayed. Um, one of the things that, that we sort of do in the photography department is a lot of times we have to be, well, every time we have to be a lot closer to what's going on than the reporters might have to be and have the ability to sort of be able to have everything working at one time to get our pictures back on a, on a daily basis just as the reporters. But what we're charged to have is I had my equipment was basically a, a large footprint, had a generator, three satellite phones, um, camera gear, computers, riding in a, an open Humvee with, with four Marines. And uh, if, if you want to talk about some sort of tangled mess every day of trying to fight for your space with these 18-year-old kids who were, uh, could care less about trampling on your you know, $3,000 laptop computer or crashing your satellite phone, um, you know, it was a miracle just to sort of keep everything operating you know, in, in amongst the dust. And, Basically, every piece of equipment you have out there is something that you don't want to put in the middle of the dust storm, and that's what you basically did every day, um, hoping and praying that it was going to uh, going to make it through. There were some close calls, but by the time uh, you know everything was said and done, uh, I had uh, all of my equipment working. I brought some pictures to show um, today, which is basically just you know my one little slice of the war. You know, everybody here has had a different war experience, and and I've been back and I've seen the work of other photographers and. You know, what I saw was, was very different, and I think, you know, the beauty of sort of being embedded and, and being unilateral is, you know, w between everybody, there was a complete picture of what happened during the war. It'll just take me one minute to get set up. One, one thing, though, that, uh, <clears throat> that Rick didn't mention is that, yes, photographers have to get closer than <clears throat> reporters, but that all that means is that the people who are shooting at you sight in on the photographers and shoot the reporter, generally speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the one thing about being, being embedded was, you know, you, there was no separation between being a journalist and being a, a soldier. You know, I was wearing the same chemical suit as these guys were riding in the same vehicle, so there was no, you know, there was no distinguishing that I was just a civilian, you know, reporter covering the war. Um, once you were embedded, you, you might as well have been uh, carrying a gun instead of a camera. Uh, Look after this Marine right here. Smile. Bring him back alive. Ready. Take care of your brother here. Take care of your brother. This is my family. As far as my, the rest of my family, they're from New Jersey. I, right now, I'm not too concerned about them. People to my right and left, you guys are my fucking brothers. For. This is it, gents. It's the real deal. Top was out of your head. Do what you got to do. Make peace with your maker. Whatever you got to do. And let's go whoop some ass.
Give me the tail of people in the front. There's friendlies up there. We're fucking lined up all along the road. Call them and tell them. No fucking shoot.